All right, perfect problem two, math 251. Uh, I got a, I might have gone a little overboard on this one. I think this is pretty challenging. The good news is maybe it's more clear than the first one I gave you, but the bad news is that uh, it's pretty damn hard. But what you're trying to do is you have this piecewise function right here, and you want to make it continuous. And really, the way you're going to make this continuous using our definition of continuity. So our definition of continuity tells us a function f is continuous at some point, maybe where the x value is equal to, let's say, a, if the limit as x approaches a from the left-hand side of f of x is the same as the limit as x approaches a from the right hand side of f of x and both of those things are the same as the height of the function at that point a. That's how we figure out if a function is continuous at some point a and then a function is continuous if it's continuous at all points a in its domain. Whew, okay, so when we're dealing with piecewise functions, it turns out, I'm going to tell you this in class, that really the only two values of a that you have to consider are when we switch from this function to this function and from this one to this one. Really, we have to make sure we need to ensure continuity at x equals negative 3 and x equals 2. At negative 3, I switch from this rule to this rule. And at positive 2, I switch from this rule to this rule. And so what I want to do is make sure that the height of this function is the same as the height of this function at negative 3, or at least the limits as it approaches, and same with these two guys at 2. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to first figure out what is the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left-hand side of my function f of x. And if I'm approaching negative 3 from the left-hand side, I'm slightly less than negative 3, so I'm following this first rule right here. So i got to figure out the limit of... 1 over the square root of 1 minus x minus a half divided by x plus 3. And you can try plugging in negative 3 everywhere you see an x, but what you'll see is you get 0 over 0. So we'll have to evaluate this algebraically. We'll have to get rid of this x plus 3 here. And the way we'll get rid of this x plus 3 is finding a way to get an x plus 3 to pop out of the numerator. It'll be pretty challenging, but we'll figure it out. Get that this is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the negative side of uh, we've seen fractions inside fractions, and our strategy in that situation was to make this one fraction over one other fraction. So if I got a common denominator, I would multiply this side by 2 over 2. I'd get 2 divided by 2 times the square root of 1 minus x minus, and then I multiply this by the square root of 1 minus x over the square root of 1 minus x to get me here. And then the numerator, that's easy enough to make it a fraction. I got x plus 3 over 1. So I can get a com now that I have a common denominator, I can mash those two fractions together and call this the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the negative side of, I would have 2 minus the square root of 1 minus x divided by my common denominator, which is 2 times the square root of 1 minus x. And then that whole thing is divided by this, but instead of dividing the two fractions, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal to get 1 over x plus 3. Okay, I don't see an x plus 3 up here that I can cancel this guy with. Uh, so what am I going to do? Well, I'd like to get rid of this radical if I could somehow. And we have a trick for getting rid of radicals. We multiply by the conjugate. So I am going to take this numerator here, and specifically its conjugate, and multiply that by the top and the bottom. I'm going to take 2 plus the square root of 1 minus x and multiply that on the top and the bottom. Uh, and what that will give me is this is the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the negative side of, if I FOIL this and this, I get 2 minus 2, uh, sorry, 2 times 2, which gives me 4. And then the 2 times the square root of 1 minus x would cancel out with this 2 times the negative of the square root of 1 minus x. And then I'd have this negative times this positive leaves me with a negative. And then the square root of 1 minus x times the square root of x, sorry, square root of 1 minus x times the square root of 1 minus x is just 1 minus x. In the denominator, I have a mess. I have 2 times the square root of 1 minus x times 2 plus the square root of 1 minus x 
times, don't forget about this x plus 3 here. Wow. Uh, fortunately, it's going to get better at the limit as x approaches negative 3. Up here, I have 4 minus 1 minus x. 4 minus 1 leaves me with 3. And the 4 minus the negative x leaves me with uh, positive x. So what I have up top here is x plus 3. And I can cancel that x plus 3 and this x plus 3 to give me 1 over... I guess maybe you can leave the minuses here if you feel like it. Doesn't really matter. 2 times the square root of 1 minus x times 2 plus the square root of 1 minus x. Uh, and this is a limit I can evaluate by changing all the x's into negative 3's. I'll get 1 divided by 2 times the square root of 4. That comes from 1 minus negative 3 times 2 plus the square root of 1 minus x. Again, 1 minus negative 3 gives me 4. We'll get here. So what number is this equal to? Well, let's see. I got 1 over. This is a 2. 2 times 2 gives me 4. And then 2 plus 2 gives me 4. So I got 4 times 4. In other words, 1 16th. That was pretty damn hard, and we're nowhere near being done with this problem. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is make sure that this thing has the same height at when x equals negative 3 as this thing does, this 1 16th. But I'm going to put that on hold for a little while. I'm going to next figure out the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of this function because I'll need this limit to be the same as the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side of this middle guy. And the way I'm going to do that is uh, note that when your x value is a little bit bigger than 2, you use this middle rule here. So I want the limit of, as x approaches 2, of x times the square root of 4 minus x squared divided by x squared plus x minus 6. Try plugging in 2s, you'll get 0 over 0. So we'll attack this thing algebraically. Uh, first, we want to get rid of these absolute value signs. So if x is a little bit bigger than 2, then x squared is a little bit bigger than 4. And 4 minus some number that's a little bit bigger than 4 is a negative number. So if I want to get rid of these absolute value signs, what I have to do is put in a negative. So instead of 4 minus x squared, I got the negative of 4 minus... Okay, hang on. Let me write this a little bit more neat. So first, by putting my limit in here. Limit is x approaches 2 from the positive side. And I got this fraction. This x, I'm going to put it over here just so it's out of the way. And I'm dealing with these absolute value symbols here. And I'm getting rid of the absolute value symbols by making what's inside them negative. So I get here. And in the denominator, I got x squared plus x minus 6. Uh, maybe I'll leave that alone for now. It takes me here. I factored a little bit, but I can factor further. I can get the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of, maybe you note that you have a difference of squares here. This is 2 minus x times 2 plus x. So I got negative. I got 2 minus x. I got 2 plus x. I got an x. In the denominator, I got x squared plus x minus 6. That factors as well. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give me positive 1. Sorry, multiply to give me negative 6 and add to give me positive 1. And so those numbers are positive 3 and negative 2. And if you take this negative and you distribute it into these parentheses, you get the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of 2 minus x instead of, sorry, of x minus 2 instead of 2 minus x. That's this negative and this 2 minus x. And then I can leave everything else. I got 2 plus x, I got an x, and I got an x plus 3, and I got an x minus 2. And so now I can cancel out these x minus 2s. And so I'm evaluating the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of 2 plus x times x over x plus 3. And now I can just go changing all the x's into 2s. 2 plus 2 is 4 times 2 gives me 8, 2 plus 3 gives me 5. So what does this tell me? Okay, if I want my function to be continuous, I need the limit as x approaches 3 from the positive side to be the same as the limit as x approaches 3 from the negative side to be the same as the height of this function at 3. Note that, so I need, maybe from here, so f of negative 3 must be equal to 1 16th in order to have continuity. 
And f of negative 3 is this thing, except in place of x, there's a negative 3. So that tells me that 1 16th must be equal to, what did it, was ax plus b? a times negative 3, in other words, negative 3a plus b. And this thing here tells me that f of 2 must be equal to 8 fifths. In other words, 8 fifths must be equal to a times x, which is now 2, so 2a plus b. So I have these two equations. I know that 1 16th must be equal to negative 3a plus b, and 8 fifths must be equal to 2a plus b. And so what I got to do is solve for a and b. There's lots of different ways you can do that. Uh, let's see, what would be the easiest in this case? I think, hmm, nothing's going to be all that easy. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use substitution. So I'm going to take this equation here and this equation here. And maybe I'll move these up top so I got a little more room to write. Maybe I'll just rewrite them. 8 fifths equals 2a plus b and 1 16th equals negative 3a plus b. Um, I could solve this for b. I could subtract 2a from both sides of the equation and get that b is equal to 8 fifths minus 2a. And over here I could solve for b if I added 3a to both sides of the equation I would get that b is equal to 1 16th plus 3a. So if b is this and b is this then this must be this. In other words 8 fifths minus 2a must be equal to 1 16th plus 3a. So I can solve this equation. I only have one unknown, this a. So I could add 2a to both sides of the equation and get a 5a over here. And I could subtract 1 16th from both sides of the equation to get 8 fifths minus 1 16th. Uh, before I divide by 5, I think I'm going to get a common denominator here. So to do so, I'd have to multiply the 8 times the 16, which is kind of annoying. 8 times 8 is 64, and 64 times 2 is 128. I think I get 128 over my common denominator, which would be 80, minus 5 over 80 is equal to 5a. I think that if you find a common denominator, I think you can show that this is equal to this, and this is equal to this. Uh, so 128 minus 5 leaves me with 123 over 80 is equal to 5a. And so if I divide both sides by 5, I get that a is equal to 123 divided by uh, 80 times 5 is 400. Wow. And if this is what a is equal to, I can then figure out what b is equal to. Because I have equations up here that say b is equal to something in terms of a. I think I'm going to pick on this one here. I know that b is equal to 8 fifths minus 2a. And since a equals this, I can say b equals 8 fifths minus 2 times 123 over 400. So if I multiply this 2 into this fraction, I can cancel this 2 with half of this 400 and get 8 fifths minus 123 over 200. And if I wanted a common denominator, I have to multiply this by 40 over 40, I would get 320 divided by 200 minus 123 divided by 200. And 320 minus 123 whew, is equal to what, 197 over 200. What a mess. Uh, so what's my answer to the question? A is equal to 123 four hundredths and B is equal to 197 over 200. Uh, and sorry, wow, I probably used a lot of your brain power and time this week. Pretty challenging. Hopefully you learned something out of it, all these limits, but I think the numbers were especially nasty. I probably could have made them nicer if I felt like it, but I guess I didn't. Sorry.